hello and it is time for another episode of subculture after dark you've got dave and you've got harley welcome to the show <laughs> and we have got an absolute killer story you might remember last episode we were kind of teasing you by saying we had a really big name lined up and we were hoping that it was going to work because we didn't actually have the we had the interview confirmation but the interview hadn't happened so we didn't want to talk about it but it did happen so i'm proud to say that we do have danny filth from cradle of filth on the show this fortnight <laughs> we're also going to chat to burning witches we're going to chat to death stars we've got skinny from death stars joining us raf from broken earth joined us as well a great aussie band um he actually chatted to us while he was on the road um we've also got some more aussie music with uh flitcraft uh phil from flitcraft is going to chat to us about um their brand new album and we're going to play their brand new single as well but of course yeah our biggie this time is cradle of filth but also i gotta say mate i reckon my worst ever interview is on this show and i know that doesn't sound like an endorsement <laughs> does it <laughs> but uh... I, I had an what they call in sporting terms an absolute mare um with burning witches so let me let me just run through exactly what happened so i got the offer from a publicist to do an interview with burning witches they were a band that i liked so i was kind of like yep this is going to be absolutely cool um the publicist messaged me and said you're going to be chatting to laura from the band i'm like even better that's the lead singer i know a fair bit about her um i know what her interests are i know what she loves to write her music about so i sat down had all these kick-ass interview questions about the themes from the brand new album, um, how stuff from her life inspires her with her music and stuff like that. And then through comes the Zoom call. And the first thing I noticed that's not right is that it says CC has entered the room. I'm thinking CC. Uh, okay, maybe Laura has a has a like a, a hidden profile or something on Zoom. And then I jump into the call and I just say, hello. And I say here, hi, it's Courtney. And I'm like, okay, that's not Laura. <laughs> <laughs> not only is not only is it not Laura, but Courtney's only been in the band for a very, very short time. She didn't actually do much work on this album. In fact, she joined the band after the album was pretty much recorded. So we didn't get to talk a lot about um, the actual album itself, but you can hear some really, really awkward questions in there from me as I'm trying to gauge just how much she did actually do on this album and how much she knows about it. But, but have you ever had that before, like with an interview or something like that, where it's just not gone the way that you wanted it to go? I, I just expect nothing in life goes the way <laughs> you want it to go. So <laughs> I'm just, I, I think the safest thing is just to be prepared to listen to what they're saying and bounce off that. That's, that's usually my go-to because yeah, that, that heaps of preparation can, it is great, but it can also, you know, kick you in the butt if you're <laughs> relying too heavily on it as you just found out because <laughs> i reckon like with probably the worst experience i'd ever had with an interview before that and it wasn't the interviewee's fault it was um it was when halloween were were touring um they were about to come to australia and i'd been given an opportunity to do an interview um with them but they were in mexico when i was doing the interview and this was back in the time before Zoom. Um, this is back in the the dark ages when I first started out interviewing. And um, we used to have these things called phone cards where the, um, the publicist would give you a phone card. You would dial the numbers that you were given and, and use the phone card. Well, I was given their um, hotel room in Mexico. I was told to ring the hotel, um, ask to speak to the band, and I'd be... Um, put up to their room to do the interview. So I'd use the phone card. I rang the hotel in Mexico. And as it would happen, the person that answered the phone couldn't speak English um, on the reception desk. So I'm saying to them, I need to speak to Halloween 
And no, I'm getting on grave. No, not Halloween. Today. Yes, that's exactly what I was getting. <laughs> no, 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 no Halloween here. Um, and then they hung up on me. So I rang back again and I said, oh, I need to need to speak to Halloween. Oh, no Halloween hung up again. Um, I'm like, this is not going to happen. So I've rung again. And this time I've thought, you know what? I'm just going to say, is there anyone there that can speak English? So I said, is there anyone there that can speak English before they could even say anything? So they go and get somebody who I think from what they said was actually the cleaner um, could speak English. Um, I told them I need to talk to this band. They said something in Spanish and the next minute I was put through to the band. But yeah, those kind of things <laughs> <laughs> do happen. I also had an actress at one point who had a wardrobe malfunction in front of me while I was interviewing her in her hotel room and she didn't notice that she'd had the malfunction. So, and I wasn't sure whether I had to say, um, um, excuse me, or just keep on going. So I kept on going until her assistant stepped in and told her, but uh, yeah, this burning witches one would probably definitely be up there with like one of the, <laughs> and you'll probably hear it in my voice at the start of the interview as well. There's like absolute panic when I realize that it's not the person <laughs> I should be talking to. So, but, uh, but I think it worked out in the end, right? It did, but you can probably hear that panic at the start. And if you hear any like tapping of keys, it's because I'm quickly trying to Google her to try and find out information while the interview is happening. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> not one of my proudest moments, but um, hey, we thought we, we thought we would include it in the episode just um, so you can hear what happened. And we did get some good takes as well. It was nice to talk to. And just to remind you all, this is a professional show. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we did we did get a chance to to meet the new member um, of the band, and look, she did give us an insight into what it's been like coming into an established band. And like she said, it's a kind of awkward situation for her because she's coming into a band that's just got a new album out, and she's having to learn everything. So um, yeah, yeah, that would be the the weirdest part because you know I've auditioned to be a vocalist in bands before, and you know you're coming into a room full of people that have been working together for who knows how many years it's like okay i'm i'm already on the back foot here they they've got their vibe they know each other in and out and just where to go when you know with whatever happens and you're just there the whole time thinking okay what do i do where's my in what 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 how who why <laughs> yeah and the other awkward part for her as well is she doesn't know how long she's going to be in the band for because courtney's come into the band to replace one of the other members who's gone on maternity leave. So um, she doesn't know, like she kind of says in the interview, she doesn't know if she's there for 12 months, whether she's there for two years or, or yeah, sometimes musicians don't return back to a band once they've started a family as well. So yeah, she doesn't know how long she's there for either, but you know what, let's kick it off with Burning Witches tonight because their brand new track is just absolutely amazing. So let's kick it off with the dark tower make sure you stick around because like i said we've got a big show with a bunch of interviews tonight and at the end of the show we're going to debut a brand new australian track that i know a lot of you are going to be excited about so make sure you stick around for the entire show but to kick it off here is burning witches with the dark tower
And welcome back to Subculture After Dark. Well, we know that you are in love with Burning Witch's brand new album, The Dark Tower, because every time a new single has come out, you guys have voted for it to make the top 10 on our show every week. So we thought, you know what? The album is out now. Let's actually get Courtney from the band on the phone to chat a little bit about this album. Welcome to the program, Courtney. Hello, hello, everyone. Good evening. (laughs) So, Courtney, tell us a little bit about this album, because like I said, our listeners have fallen in love with every single single that has come out so far. Tell us a little bit about this album and and the work that's gone into it. Um, So, fifth release, and uh, I mean, I've been a fan even before, you know, helping out uh, for, you know, these tours coming up for years, and the one thing with their albums... Yeah, the consistency and with each album, just the evolution of the band, you know, just pushing the barriers and especially with Dark Tower. I mean, just from start to finish, it's just such a great album. Now, and, uh, yeah, I know they put a lot of work into this and, you know, I'm just so glad it's out. It's doing really well and, you know, I just can't wait to start touring for it. Now, a lot of people have been calling this the best album that you've all uh, recorded to date. What was the early talk with this album did you all have a goal that you wanted to achieve with this album when you first sat down to record it well obviously i I stepped in later but uh you know they just got the theme together 
And then the songs just, you know, just start start pouring out, no pun intended, with the front of the album with all the blood. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I just, you know, they sat down, got these songs done right, right into the studio. You know, it's a really great thing with this band as well. You know, it's album, 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 album. It's just the songs just appear, and they're just such great songwriters, especially Ramada. Yeah. The lyrics, I mean, it's just a full package. So tell us a little bit about your own journey. How did you come to join the band, and what has it been like for you so far being a part of Burning Witches? Um, well, for me, I started playing uh, 13 from Philadelphia, and uh, started touring 15 with different projects, and then 18 moved to Los Angeles and joined the Iron Maidens, as we all know. And uh, it was recently, um, we were on tour with Accept. Uh, a few months ago, and uh, Ramana and some of the girls came out to our Zurich show, and uh, you know they just asked if I could you know lend a, lend my guitar because uh, Larissa was on or was starting maternity leave, and you know here I am, and we'll see where the journey goes. What was that like for you at that time when they approached you? Like, what did you were you surprised or how did you react? <laughs> no, it's funny. I mean, we've been sisters for years. You know, yeah. I've, uh, played a solo on their uh, Hex and Hammer album for Made in Steel. Uh, we did a COVID jam acoustic for Black Magic. You know, we just, you know, it was a coven basically, even though it wasn't really in the coven. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. And I know I, I couldn't say no. I know I had other things with the maidens and stuff, but, you know, they, you know, really needed me. So, you know, I just took the leap and. You know, it's just awesome. Definitely my wheelhouse, you know, metal-wise, and the genre of metal. I'm very happy. You know, it's just a, it's a fun ride. Now, a lot of young musicians out there are probably wondering this question. When you come into a band that's already established, like Burning Witches are, do you have to go back and learn most of their back catalogue for tours and things like that? Or how does that work for you being a newbie into the band? Um, it's it's quite easy, you know. They have a set, and then yeah, you just gotta learn the material, and you know, from set to set, there'll be new newer songs, older songs. You know, you just gotta keep on top of it, and you know, keep pushing. You gotta be a, a human jukebox, as I say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this new album, when were you kind of exposed to it? Were you sent the tracks before the album was released or how did that work for you especially knowing that you'll probably be heading out on tour soon having to play these tracks you know it was funny because i was still on the accept tour so on the tour bus so you know i was sent three tracks and you know they're so nice like you know if you want to throw your spin on this because you know it was already recorded but they sent me uh, unleash the beast world on fire and tomorrow and they said you know just have at it do what you want and uh Instead of going back to the States, I uh, went to Switzerland, went into the studio to lay down my own solo on those three songs. And I, I think they're on the digital release, if you want to hear them. But, uh, yeah, it was just work, work, work on a tour bus, <laughs> getting ready to go on for the maidens, having another guitar and a different tuning. <laughs> but, you know, it all came together, and I'm really happy about it. You know, it's just, like I said, it's such a great album. The songs are just amazing. That, that's a pretty big shift for you as well, going from the US to Switzerland. What was that like, going to Switzerland and recording? And then are you moving to Switzerland, or what are your plans now? Well, I mean, the Accept tour was in Europe already, so, you know, it was one less flight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of back and forth from California to Switzerland, but I'm in the process of uh, moving back to Philadelphia, so I'm more equidistant between the two bands. Awesome. So tell us yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so tell us a little bit now about like it's it's I can't even fathom what it must have been like getting that um approach for you but coming out of covid that time period was a really weird period because I'm guessing that you weren't playing many shows during that time how did you spend that time during covid uh, sleeping <laughs> <laughs> no um I mean just what I normally do is you know practicing you know, social media at that time turned into this great meeting spot for, you know, musicians around the world, everyone doing these jam videos. You know, I did a bunch of King Diamond ones, I did, did, you know, Jen Margera's uh, One Minute Jams. You know, but people just came together, you know, over the internet, which is very strange for everyone because for musicians, we spent most of the year on the road, so now to be 
you know, solitary confinement in your house. Yeah. <laughs> we were kind of going nuts, but, uh, but a lot of, you know, creativity came out of it and progression playing. And I mean, even just on the personal side, I think it gave all the musicians it's that time at home that we're not used to, whether it be, you know, partners, family. So, I mean, there, it was, there was a bad side and a good side, but, you know, obviously we all came through it, thankfully. I know a lot of musicians use that time to get their body right as well, especially a lot of drummers. A lot of drummers have told me that their bodies were so banged up from years and years on the road that that two years off um, kind of suddenly meant that they were waking up without shoulder and elbow pain and things like that. Yeah. Was was that something for you as well? Was it a great time to, to reset and let the body recover from all the touring as well? Yeah, uh, well, double-edged sword, you know, the body would recover, but <laughs> the exercising and running around on stage kind of went out the window, so you have to be very careful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just sitting at home, you know, on your butt, basically. But uh, it, it was a good time to recover, refresh, and then, I mean, even for guitar players, you have to be careful because you don't want to lose your calluses. <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, first shows back, first tours back post-COVID, you're like, oh, man, it was like gig neck from headbanging, and, you know, it definitely uh, took a while to get back on the bike, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so how does it feel now being, like, you've been out there, like you said, doing shows? What were those first few shows like when you first got back out on stage? Did it did it feel weird, or did it feel like you were back at home? Uh, back at home, definitely. And it was just everyone was just waiting for that moment, you know. It's just the crowd. I mean, crowd and musicians alike. It was just a breath of fresh air, you know. Back to what we love. And it, it's like it, COVID never happened, you know. Yep. <laughs> so so let's go on. Definitely. So now bringing it back to the album, like I said, our listeners have fallen in love with the three singles that have come out to date. Do you feel that those three singles are a good example of what they can hear on the rest of the album as well? Oh, definitely. And, you know, I mean, I just wanted, like, Heart of Eyes and Doom to Die. There's just so many great songs. Like, it's just one of those albums, you know, like, back in the day, you would listen to the whole album start to finish and not, like, the new age of music or you just pick one song on Spotify. You know, this is definitely an album you want to put on start to finish. That title track, The Dark Tower, I think that may well be one of my favorite tracks that that, uh, that comes out this year. I doubt there'll be very many more that, that goes past that for me. Tell us a little bit about that track and what it's like for you to play on that track, because uh, I was listening to it before on Spotify, so it was, it was your version I was listening to. What was it like laying down the guitar for that track? Because it's just absolutely well, amazing. Actually, uh, the Dark Tower is actually not me. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I was Unleash the Beast, uh, World on Fire, and uh, Tomorrow. Unless you're talking about Unleash the Beast. No, 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 I was talking about the Dark Tower. No, you're for, not a Dark Tower. For all, of our listeners, oh, for all of our listeners out there, I'm not being an idiot tonight. We actually had... Um, <laughs> you had one job. Yeah. <laughs> I've spent all day doing research um, for the album, and then at the last minute, Courtney came in to do the interview, so we're both very, very cold at this interview at the moment, so you'll have to forgive us. But yeah, um, th th these tracks, the guitar... But I, do, but I do get to play it live. I'm not on the actual recording, but I do get to play it live, and it is, it, I mean, it, it is just heavy. Completely love it. I mean, it's one of the songs that has everything. Great lyrics, great riffs, great solo... And just the great ending, you know, it's just a full package. Yeah, I, I said in my review, this uh, has the potential to becoming one of those great metal albums, and I've read a couple of reviews since then, and the same thing has been said. H what are your thoughts on that, like, that this could be one of the albums of the year? Like I, I said at the start of this interview, that, you know, following this band throughout their career, they just keep pushing the boundaries, and each album it just gets better and better and better and better. I mean, I mean, they're all great. Uh, there's something special about this one. They, they found the magical, no pun intended, a combination just with everything, and I think it will be one of those albums that everyone's going to have, and everyone just, throughout time it will have a stamp in history. So tell us a little bit about what other plans now for Burning Witches for the rest of this year. Um, will you be touring for the rest of the year, or what are the plans there? Um, actually, the first CD release show is tomorrow. Zed's even in Switzerland. Um, 
and then it's just a few CD release shows, and then uh, we start a festival season. So yeah, we're gonna be gone, busy, busy. <laughs> so one of the Looking big <laughs> one of the big questions I know that a lot of our listeners have been wanting me to ask: Is there any chance of a Burning Witches Australian tour in the future? Oh, I hope so, because I miss me some Lord of the Fries <laughs> <laughs> and Hungry Jacks. <laughs> No, no, we'd love to come down under it, but, you know, just uh, keep your ears open and hopefully we're there soon. Definitely. Well, I know we are running out of time very, very quickly. So to finish off, Courtney, what would you like to say to everybody out there who is about to sit down and take a listen to this album? Uh, just play it loud. Definitely. <laughs> and my advice is, my advice as well would be to get a physical copy because the you mentioned before about the cover. The cover art on this is absolutely amazing. So if you are someone out there that's listening at the moment, make sure you get a physical copy of this as well. Courtney, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. I know you stepped in at the last moment, so thank you so much for that. Hopefully we do get to see Burning Witches back in Australia sometime soon. And welcome back to Subculture After Dark, listeners. Well, we've got something very, very special for you right now. 
Death Stars have got a brand new album coming out called Everything Destroys You. And we thought, you know what, we want to know a little bit more about this album. So actually, let's get one of the guys from the band on the phone right now. Welcome to the program, Skinny. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. How are you? I am really well, and we are so glad to have you on the show because we have been so excited about this album coming out. And I was wondering if you could start off by telling us a little bit about how this album has come about after eight years between releases. Yeah, well, yeah, as you mentioned, it's been quite a while and it it is a long process for us always. It is, you know, we usually have about five years in between albums. So there's a lot of work to be done to make an album. And yeah, we're not the most efficient always. We know that. But the most important thing for us is that uh, we when we end up with a, an album that we're happy about the result. And this time we we had our, yeah, sort of difficulties with our previous album. We, uh, we toured quite a lot on different continents of the world and we had, yeah, a lot of issues. We had a bus exploding in Europe. We played the sound wave in Australia, which got bankrupt and yeah, we never got paid for it. So that set some obstacles for us. And then we went to US. We crashed on the highway. I had to cancel shows because we couldn't get there on time. Uh, yeah, went to Mexico, had to cancel shows because of cartels and stuff. So. Uh, we had a rough year. We got back home and we decided that now we need a year break at least. And we didn't do anything for a year band related. And then slowly we started writing songs. But, you know, in the start, it's it's just skeletons and, and riffs and ideas, sort of. But here we are today, yeah. eight years later. It, explosions, accidents, and the cartel. That sounds like the making of a Michael Mann film. Did you fear for your life during any of those times? Yeah, many times. Yeah, it, it was, you know, it, it was weird. Uh, with the bus, bus exploding, we, we just came out of a tunnel in Austria, and the bus was totally lit. Uh it was in the morning we just came out of the tunnel and it was filled with smoke and there was explosions coming out of the back of the bus and in the engine so we just had to run out in our socks in a very cold and damp and uh wet uh i don't remember what 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 part of the year it was but it was it was it wasn't nice and just to see all our clothes and everything just burn out uh uh, it was crazy. If, if if we wouldn't have come out of that tunnel, uh, we we would probably die from yeah the smoke and the stuff. So we were lucky in a way that nobody got hurt. Yeah, how? Uh, and we have all the other <laughs> happenings. But yeah, yeah it, it was an eventful year. As a creative person, how do you come back from something like that? Do you put your emotions and your feelings into your work? Or oh, I know that you said you, you took time out, but did you find yourself using those things as part of your creativity in your writing, or did you just try to to put it completely out of your mind? Well, I think it, not in a conscious way, uh, but I would say. Yeah, of course, everything you do in life will affect you uh, and will inspire you no matter what you do. Yeah. But I don't think any of those events specifically has become a song or something like that. It's more like, yeah, it's, it just adds up to the pile of weird shit that's been going down through the years. <laughs> yeah. So, what did you guys find yourself writing about for this album? Like you said, that with that little bit of a gap there as well, when you first got back to writing music, were there things that you found that were inspiring your music at that time? Always with Death Stars, it's it's coming back to ourselves. It's, it's about your inner conflicts or uh, what you're struggling with yourself and, and within the band or within, yeah, with, the person writing and you know it's we never really care about what's happening around us we're kind of self-centered in that kind of way but you can always uh, see the reflection of what we're, what we're writing 
in the world, I would say. You know, we have a title called Everything Destroys You, and I think these days probably everything is destroying you. So uh, it's, it's a very positive way of thinking, but I think... <laughs> Yeah, I think you should uh, you shouldn't let it let 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 yourself down or yeah become all depressed about it. Just know about it and kind of have fun with it. You know, it's it's just everything is destroying you anyway. So just have a little fun in the meantime. Yeah, we had a pretty major thing called a pandemic in the middle of all of that as well. Did that kind of hold up your songwriting and recording process as well? <laughs> No, that's when we got a little bit extra time for this album. We we almost had the album finished right before the pandemic and we were ready to release it. But then the pandemic hit and then we uh yeah, we we got some extra time and wrote some new songs that felt a lot stronger and we could work a little bit on, on some of the old ones. So I think uh as far as the band goes, I think it kind of helped us but then again on a personal note you never knew how long it, it was gonna last so you were you weren't the most positive person during that period i would say yeah. and you know we're still struggling prices are going up for traveling and and it's going to be really hard for all bands these days unless we higher all the ticket prices a lot but then nobody's coming to the show so uh, it's it's um yeah, I really, I, I just think we need to get over this bump, uh, in a way. Uh, it's, it's, it's still, it's still a problem, and I, I think we need to find a solution. Yeah, I was going to work right now. I was going to ask that. What, what do you do? Like, I know a lot of bands at the moment are talking about the fact that coming to somewhere like Australia is completely out of the question because of how much it would um, cost. Do you look at doing things like live streams for fans in countries like Japan, Australia, and New Zealand? Or what kind of things have you talked about as a band to to reach out to all of your fans during this time? Yeah, no, we, we haven't really talked about doing anything like that. And I don't think it's a good compliment. I think you could you could do that as well. Yeah. But I, I don't think it, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it's hard. I think, I think we, so far we're kind of, yeah, kind of eyes half open, kind of going into this, uh, just still hoping we can find a way for it to, to work. You know, we're, we've never made any money out of this, this job. So, uh, we're probably not going to continue doing that. And, uh, uh, yeah, just as long as we don't, you know, lose too much on a personal note going somewhere, we'll, we will go, you yeah. know, uh, it, you know, if we can find, yeah. yeah, these days, you know, you have to be an influencer as well. So maybe we can find a paid partnership with an airline or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Going back to one, going back to one of the points that you made before, you said that the album was pretty much ready to go, but then the pandemic happened, and um, you ended up writing more tracks. I've I've spoken to another band who said that they had an album ready to go. The pandemic happened, and they ended up scrapping every single song that was ready to go before, and and did a completely different album. Um, tell us a little bit about that process. What was it that made you guys decide to to write more music during that time? And was it easy to let go some of those tracks that were ready to go before, or was that a difficult process as well? No, it's not the difficult process because you know as soon as you start writing on a new track, that that you, you almost immediately feel that this is a stronger track, this is what I want to work at. And you, you haven't scrapped the other track just yet, you know. And then, then then you just compare it later on in the process. And, and you know, which song is going on the album? This one is. So, and it felt more natural. We had parts in the other songs that didn't feel, you know, 100%. And and I think we, we're super happy about this album. There's... there's for us, there's not a weak link on this album, and that's that's something to be very proud of, I think. Definitely, and of course, we've been playing um, we've been playing Angel of Fortune and Crime on our show, and we've been getting so many requests for it from um, your fans out there. Um, tell us a little bit about tracks like that. Like, is that a good indication of what 
fans can expect to hear from the rest of the album as well? Yeah, well, that that song is um, it's kind of a typical Death Star song with one of the like heavy, heavy, uh, heavier t- like guitar riffs. Uh, it's yeah, I, I would say it's a typical in, in the style of Tongues or Chertograd and like it, it's it's that kind of track and uh, of course it's a good representative of the album but. Like all the three singles we've released so far with This Is, that's more of a banger, kind of a, a little more up-tempo. And then we have Midnight Party, which is more of a poppy, catchy tune. And there's so much more on the album as well that that kind of shows the variety of, of the band. And that's what we really wanted to, yeah, yeah. What, what we wanted to reach. With the album, we have a track called Anatomic Prayer, which is almost like a progressive rock anthem. Uh, so somebody, somebody told me that this album, it's like a, a, a heavy disco opera. Yep. <laughs> I thought it was, <laughs> uh, it's a, uh, I, I took that as a compliment because it's, it, it an opera will always have a variety of uh, of dynamics. So, uh, and uh, my name is Skinny Disco, so I can't be too bummed about. <laughs> when I was listening to the album today, that was one of the things that really stood out to me: the variety of the tracks that are on there, but also the strength of every one of those tracks. Was it difficult to pick? which track should be singles because it felt like any track on this album could have been a single we knew this is was going to be a single and i knew from the start when i heard midnight party that i wanted to party to that song and i think any song that you wanted to party to is is a good uh single i think yep <laughs> so i think those two were kind of given then the record company really wanted angel of fortune and crime as the single and we we were supposed to do just a lyric video for that one and we did kind of half half music video and lyric video for that one um and then we also we will be releasing uh, uh everything destroys you with a video soon just right after the album uh, releases so and those tracks i think are quite representative of of showing a variety of the album but as i said you know i think there is more um on the album definitely uh, and, and it was it, it wasn't super hard but you you always want to check with others family members whatever you know to see what do you think is this catchy enough and uh yeah and we we decided on these, but yeah, we, we could have chosen a few others. You never know which ones are going to hit it off. Definitely. Well, I know we are running out of time very, very quickly, but I just wanted to ask, uh, what have you guys got planned now for the rest of this year with the album coming out this week? What have you got planned after that? Yeah, we're uh, going to, yeah, we have a few uh, festivals here in June. Um and uh, then in the yeah, upcoming, yeah, I think October will will be touring. Uh, yeah, we have one tour which is not confirmed yet in early October, and then end of October we are, uh, yeah, just touring Europe like crazy uh, until mid December, and then hopefully at start of next year we can go to other com- continents and hopefully come down under if we find a way that makes it possible that would be great i was about to say we can't wait to see you guys back down under back here in australia but for now what would you like to say to all of your aussie fans out there before they sit down and take a listen to everything destroys you well i just want to thank for the patience uh of waiting all these years for us to finish this album and uh, i really hope that yeah, to see all of you uh, when we when we find a way to come back down there and uh, Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi. <laughs> well, Skinny Disco, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. It's been an absolute honor having you on the show, and we're actually going to take a listen to Angel of Fortune and Crime on the show right now. So, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.
And welcome back to Subculture After Dark. Well, I'm about to play you what I think is going to be one of the singles of this year. It is the brand new track from Broken Earth. It's called Breathe, and this is an absolutely amazing track. So I thought, you know what? We need to get to the bottom of this track. Let's get Raf from the band on the phone. He's on the road right now, but Raf, welcome to the show. Hi, I am going well, mate. What are you doing on the road so early on a Saturday morning? That's a really good question, mate. So we had to um, we had to organise our trip around this uh, this Tamworth show we're doing at the moment, this headliner. Um, when we uh, when we originally started organising all these shows, uh, we we didn't really expect um, quite the early um, quite the early um, uh, adventure. But you know what, man? I'm here for the I'm here for the journey. Um, I'm stoked to be talking to you at the same time, man. How you going? I am going really well. Mate, like I said, I love this track. This track is absolutely amazing. Tell us a little bit about how Breathe has come to be about. Come about. It's a really, really good question. So, um, this song was written way back in 2020 during lockdown. It was the first demo we, we started really um, fleshing out, I'd say, um, amongst all the other material that we will, uh, you know, uh, hopefully one day be showcasing to you guys. Um, it started out completely different. There was a synth intro with like this bring me the horizon sort of melodic vibe. And to be quite honest with you, Dave, it was the one song as we were prepping to record with our producer, Mark, um, that we just didn't like. Like we just, we couldn't, like, like some of the guys like one section, uh, other guys like other sections and we can never get this chorus to stick so uh, when we got into the studio uh, we really just wanted to um, to to write to, to kind of do away with any of the niceties any of the melodies and just go for something like just ferocious just straight up expressive as a way to just encapsulate uh, what's going on with the lyrics of the song and to be quite honest with you Dave uh it, it gets me pretty stoked even when I'm at the gym at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think um, I think if it gets me if it gets me pumped, hopefully it gets a few other people pumped as well, man. It's uh, yeah, yeah, no. Um, so I think it was the one with the most amount of rewrites. Yeah. But uh, we're pretty happy with how it turned out, uh, all things considered. Definitely. Now, you've been quoted as saying that this is a track that you thought that 16-year-old you would have wanted to write. Tell us a little bit about that. What did you mean by that? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, that's a, a bit of a bit of a vague statement, I understand. But in, in all honesty, um, you know, I think I wrote it for that in a, in a teenager, in a, you know, misfit, as, as maybe um, uh, you, may, you may call it. Um, Especially throughout high school, and as I as I uh, started to grow, I, I I looked at the the people around me and the kind of the the situations that I landed in, and uh, nine times out of ten, uh, mate, I was the one kind of uh, kind of being their um, I'd say emotional punching bag. Yep. And kind of having to to hold all my stuff in, and uh, yeah, it it led to quite. Um, quite emotionally abusive, uh, you know, friendships and situations and relationships um, to the point where I questioned my own mental health. You know, I was gaslit on and off for about three years. And it, 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 after I got out of that situation, you know, after I, after I kind of, you know, cut all my ties and kind of focused on what I wanted to do, you know, focus on the band, focus on living my own life, um, I realised just how angry that made me yeah. and how much I wish I could have you know, gone back and actually said something at the time. So it's kind of like a time capsule in a way, I'd say, of all of that rage that I I wanted to um, express but couldn't at the time. Yep. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it definitely um, it definitely ticks that box in terms of uh, uh, helping uh, helping uh, you know younger me kind of come to terms with with all that had happened there. I get the feeling that this is going to be a track that a lot of people listen to and they can relate to the lyrics. Are you guys kind of ready for people to reach out to you and say, hey, you know what, I've been through that situation, I know what you're talking about? Yeah, man, I, it's, 
it's kind of already happened. When we were demoing it and showing it to a few close friends, they were like, dude, like this, this actually connects straight with, you know, what's happening at home or this is exactly how I felt uh, going through, you know, this breakup or something. And um, look, to be quite honest, you're never really fully ready. Um, I remember a particular show last year where, um, you know, a fan came up to me and uh, quite openly expressed how one of our songs had, um, you know, uh, I, I guess helped her through a really, really dark spot in her life. And she was, you know, kind of um, very beautifully, you know, expressing that all to me. And I, at the time, I was I was almost in shock. I had no idea how to respond. So I think it's definitely something that um, we, we're adjusting to. We're adjusting to this this new, uh, I guess, era, uh, I'd say, of um, openness and vulnerability with our music. But yeah. to be quite honest, Dave, that's what we've always aimed for, is we've always aimed to be a band that's just, um, you know, completely exposed, expressive. You know, there's no, there's no um, real, uh, I'd say, you know, trying to pretend to be cool than you are or, you know, trying to go for some high concept you know, fantasy film, like we're, we're, we're doing some right angry music, trying to connect with other people. And that's, that's all we've ever tried to do, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess in a way, uh, it's, it's, it's always something that we prepare for. And if it's, if it's a conversation that, uh, comes up, we're absolutely, uh, ready, we're absolutely ready for it. Definitely. Now, I understand that you guys have been pretty busy recording recently as well. What can we expect from you guys this year? Oh, man. Um, yeah, look, uh, it's, <laughs> it's going to be a bit of a busy one. Um, we are going to be absolutely running ourselves into the ground, that's for sure. Um, yeah, we've uh, we've just um, we've, we've recorded a few songs with our uh, producer, Mark, from Inertia last year. And um, after after a bit of a, a, a reforming within the band and kind of taking our time to to really help these songs come to justice, uh, I'd say uh, I'd say we have at least um, a couple more singles to show you at least this year, and uh, definitely more to show you as well next year as well. We um we, uh, you haven't heard from you haven't heard the last from us uh, at any time soon. Awesome. And of course, you've got the show in Tamworth tonight. Have you got more shows lined up for this year as well? Or can you not tell us about that at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely a few I can't tell you about, but which will be um, announced in due time. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, we've got the Tamworth one tonight, which um, I think literally sold out last night, which is insane. Uh, first ever headliner and... Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we're ready for what's going to happen, but you know we're just going to just going to take it as it comes and have a have the time of our lives. And then we're doing um we're doing a free headliner with Shakes Appeal in Canberra, uh, uh, organised by Burnt Out Bookings. So we're very happy with that one. Uh, keen to do a free gig, and you know it's for a good cause. You know, bringing awareness to new venues uh, in in places like Canberra. And then um. I don't know. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it yet because I haven't announced. But um, uh, we will be doing a, a special grief release show in Sydney on June 16th, um, and that one is going to be uh, that one's going to be a big one. I'll just put it that way. Awesome. Well, mate, we are going to play "Breathe" on our show right now. What would you like to say to everybody Fantastic. out there before they take a listen to this amazing track? Oh, what would I like to say, man? That's a that's 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 a bit of a question. Um, look, uh, to anyone that connects with this song, um, I hope that uh, we we all get to meet you at some stage. I hope uh, I hope it gives you the power that we wanted to give you, and um, can't wait to uh, can't wait to see how you will connect with it. Well, Raf, have a safe journey to Tamworth. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today, and I'm sure we'll have you back on very, very soon with the next track coming out as well. Thank you so much for having me, Dave. It's been an absolute pleasure. Green.
And welcome back to Subculture After Dark, where we've got something very, very special for you right now. There is an Aussie prog rock heavy metal band that I know that you just need to know about. They're called Flitcraft, and they've got a brand new album out that we're going to talk about in just a moment called House at the Center of the Universe. And we thought we would actually chat to Phil from the band to find out a little bit more about this amazing album. So welcome to the program, Phil. Wonderful. Thanks so much for having me, Dave. Now, mate, this album is just absolutely amazing. I've been listening to it all day, and I've completely fallen in love with it. So, congratulations. I don't know what to say. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm I'm glad you dig it. So, tell us a little bit about how this album came together. What were you aiming to achieve with this album when you first sat down to start work on it? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I guess this is... Because this is the second Flipcraft album... And this is the result of, the first one was a lockdown project. I had a bunch of songs that I'd gathered over the years and hadn't done anything with. So I thought it was time to get some demos together and and get a band to record it. And that's what I did in over 2020 and 2021. And then during that time, I was just having so much fun that the songs just kept coming. And um, making a concept album had always been a dream of mine and I think I got a, a, a bit of extra inspiration somewhere in there about thinking I had a good idea for a story and I thought well maybe it's time to pull the trigger on this and just keep just go for gold and um, and before I knew it I was uh, yeah I was stitching together a concept album and then I thought well you know I'll make it the second album and I'll just keep going and then by by early 2022 uh, is that last year? Time's gone funny. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, early last year, we were, we were ready to record it again, so we just went for it. So tell us a little bit about the concept behind this album, because it's got a great story behind it as well, with a little bit of sci-fi thrown in there. Tell us a little bit about that story and where that story first came from for you. Yeah, cool. Yeah, glad to. Um, well, I can actually remember the, the first moment when I, when I had inspira- inspiration to... To, to come up with the story of the, the, the young android, half android, half human character, Uli. I was sick in bed in, in, in 2020 and I was watching The Terminator and I thought, this will be what I have to do eventually if I start doing, if I start writing a story or doing a concept album. It'll have to be something about humanity versus technology or humanity integrated with technology or some kind of semi-dystopian thing like that. And and that was when the seed was kind of planted. It didn't all come to me just then, but I remember thinking that will be the thread that this story has to take. And uh, and and then uh, eventually, as I started getting serious about it, the, the story just kind of took shape. About it would be about the young character who's who's half human and half half robot. It's kind of analogy for for the way we live our lives now. Is 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 we're, we're it, human but with so much of it integrated with technology and I wanted to use that as a kind of metaphor for the adolescence growing into adulthood and 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 dealing with all that um yeah so that was kind of the genesis of it and that's that's where it started to take shape so you mentioned that you were watching Terminator when that idea first came to you have you always been a sci-fi fan yeah absolutely yeah absolutely um very, not not just like pop sci-fi, like Star Wars, Star Trek, um, you know, the Alien movies, um, the Terminator films. Um, I only started reading sci-fi probably a few years ago, but mainly sci-fi cinema, and I've always just loved the the, the imagery of it. And um, yeah, big big fan of the original Star Wars films, and I think that that's kind of what I've always liked to wanted to achieve musically as well, just to kind of create the oral versions of. <laughs> Of, um, of classic movies that I love, like like the first Star Wars films and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Um, those are massively inspiration, massively inspirational to me as a, as, a, as a young guy, and that's and then being a big like Rush Rush fan and um, early uh, like Judas Priest, Iron Maiden. That's kind of they kind of they can kind of go together and create this. Um, you know, the overall atmosphere creates that kind of. Um, and that's what I wanted to create musically. I was going to ask that. Is this the first time that you've had that inspiration from sci-fi or has sci-fi been something that's inspired your music in the past as well? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I've always, I've always, 
um, tried to sneak a sci-fi reference or some sci-fi lyrics into, into my previous bands. The main band I was doing before this um, called Galaxy is, um, <laughs> surprise, surprise, Galaxy. Um, <laughs> and the guy, um, Stu Callanan, a good friend of mine, he writes the music for, 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 for those albums. And when, when we met, his music didn't have any lyrics. And he um, the first thing he, he we started talking about was, was lyrical uh, lyrical direction. And I said, look, I'm very, you know, <laughs> I love sci-fi. And uh, so I was probably going to end up being 50% of the lyrics. And he's like, man, as long as it sounds cool, I'm in. <laughs> and, and that was kind of where, where that went. So a lot of, it's definitely a background a background for me. And, and um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't write love songs, you know. I, I, I write songs about my observations being, being around in sci-fi just always somehow uh, plays into that naturally. Yeah. Now, approaching a concept album for the songwriting, did you find that writing with that concept in mind, did that make the songwriting process easier than normal or did it make it harder? That's a good question. And it's the answer is twofold. It, it made it more difficult because whenever you write something... You can't just write a song and just be happy with it as a song. Everything you do is dependent on every other aspect of the album. So when you write one thing, you've always got the other eight, ten songs in mind. So whenever you make a decision, be it, you know, how long a song is, how long a lyric is, how long a riff is, you're always thinking about how it affects the rest of the album. So in that sense, it was very, very challenging. But in another sense... Being constricted is good as well because it stops you from wandering off. So I like being constricted in certain ways, and this was very much a constriction. So when you go to make a decision about how long a song should be or if a certain lyric uh, you know, is like acceptable within the realm of, of, of the album, then your decisions are made very quickly because does it fit the concept? No, it's out. You know, Does it work for the concept? Then, then yes, then, then I have to make this work. So... Uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but the answer is yes and no, but I hope that answers your yeah, question. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the recording process for this one as well. Of course, like as you said, your last album was kind of a, a pandemic album. How did that change with how you went about recording this one? Yeah, cool. Um, it, was, it was pretty similar, actually, because what got into the, 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 the demo process and the pre-production process probably in late 2021. So that was it's still very much like, you know, Melbourne certainly was still in and out of lockdown. Australia was, and but certainly Melbourne still like in and out of lockdown and a lot of uncertainty as to whether like facilities would be open or whether you were allowed to, you know, meet, meet with your bandmates and, and stand three metres apart and all, all that sort of thing. So it was, it was still kind of very much in, in, in that world at the time, but but there was hope, like, to, to, for lack of a less pretentious word. Yeah. Um, when we were getting into the pre-production process for this, I knew I could see it through. With the first album, it was still a bit like, oh, look, I'm doing this for the heck of it because otherwise I'm going to go insane or I don't really know what might come of this. But with the second album, I, you know, there was a bit more certainty. You know, there was light at the end of the tunnel, but people were all coming out of the fog. So, I, um, yeah, that's probably the only difference is that I knew that I could see it through from start to finish. And, um, yeah, we planned it accordingly. Now, with the album out there for the public to hear, what are your plans for the rest of this year? Are you hoping to get out and do a few shows, or what are the plans there? Yeah, definitely, definitely. We've got a, got a few shows booked in booked in around Melbourne. We're uh, opening for Ripper Owens at the, the Bendigo Hotel in a, in a few weeks, which will, which will be a good one, and playing with some friends from Sydney Temptress, uh, the Workers' Club, again in a few weeks. And um, and then the launch. We're doing a proper album launch for this at the Evelyn on uh, June twenty fourth. June twenty fourth. So that's going to be a, a big night. And I, because of the last few years, I haven't had a, a proper launch show for for an album in in um, well ever really. So it's really exciting to be able to plan plan a launch show for this one. And um, also heading to Sydney at the end of the year for the first time to play Steel Assassins, the first festival in November. 
Awesome. Um, yeah, but just a handful of kind of, of shows like that is, a, is the basic plan. Awesome. Well, I definitely cannot wait to head along and check out some of those shows in Melbourne. And, of course, for our listeners, in a moment, we're about to play Earth is Not a Perfect Spear. So what would you like to say to everybody out there, not only before they listen to this amazing track, but before they go out and listen to the album as well? Thanks, Dave. Um, all I can say is I hope you dig it. Please give it a chance from start to finish as the way it was was intended because it's very much a, um, a a journey from from start to finish, and I'd really appreciate that if you if you if you took it as the, as the piece it as the piece it was on whatever format you like. But just um, yeah yeah take t- take a moment to to breathe it all in if you'd be so kind. And thanks so much for listening in the first place and for your support. Well, here you go, listeners. We are now going to take a listen to Earth is Not a Perfect Sphere, taken from the House at the Center of the Universe album by Flitcraft. Phil, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. It's been an absolute honor having you on the show, and uh, we can't wait to see where everything goes for the band for the rest of this year. Legend Dave, thank you so much. Thanks, Subculture.
now, what you've all been holding out for, David interviews Cradle of Filth. Now, I wanted to ask you about this brand new album. You've recently been quoted as saying that a, a live album was a long time overdue. Tell us a little bit about why you thought now was the right time to do another live album. Uh, it was purely circumstantial, to be honest. Um, by that, I mean that we hadn't planned to do one. Just a pandemic left us with a spare amount of time. Um, we had our last record, Existence is Futile, delayed by a year. Um, yeah, it was literally finished in 2020 and uh, wasn't released in t- yeah, for, for over a year. So by the time it actually came out, I was sick to death of the songs. <laughs> and um, yeah, that also influenced our transition from our previous record label, Nuclear Blast, to our current one, Napalm. Um, and in that year, our um, live engineer just suggested, uh, why don't we, yeah, he'd recorded loads of tracks from, uh, loads of concerts from our um, world tour, which lasted for about four years. And um, it's a, well, why don't you just give them to your studio engineer, choose the songs you want and put out a live record. We thought, you know what, that's not a bad idea. Um, and then that sort of initial idea grew in fruition. And, uh, yeah, we had a shopping list of songs we wanted to put on, which was um, uh, dictated by the fact that we didn't want to, even, albeit our last live record was 20 years prior, we didn't want to have any repeats. And we also worked some fan favourites. We also worked uh, uh, a good... Uh, selection of tracks from across our back catalogue, not just focusing on one era or another, or one album or another. And, um, you know, some songs that we really wanted to do. So that was difficult in itself. And once the initial idea came into fruition, we did put a lot of love into to creating it. But essentially, it wasn't planned. Had we had planned it, we would have done something like a maiden where we would have done... Uh, uh, essentially two days and filmed both recorded both days and they had it as a live concert but instead you get a sort of a myriad of windows into cradle of filth life but i think it's you know it sounds pretty concise and it enabled us to get a good uh, selection of tracks as well you, you mentioned that process was pretty difficult going through and working out what tracks should be on there was there a method to that process at all like or was it just sitting down and discussing it and 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 coming up with what you thought would be the perfect list yeah basically that was it and uh they had to be played anyway there's no point putting on tracks that we didn't have yeah so um we we bolstered the four-year tour with um basically it was it was three years and then um we continued touring as we, as we were writing Existence is Futile, because we released the remistress version of Cruelty and the Beast. So we went out and kind of joined summer festivals in 2019 with um, a load of Cruelty and the Beast um, flavoured. In fact, we brought it to Australia and Japan as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. Australia, Japan, and New Zealand um, and played Cruelty and the Beast in its entirety. So we had those songs to choose from as well. Henceforth by Bathory Aria, which is my favourite Cradle song thus far, um, made the cut as well. It's rather selfish because it's such a long song. It takes up the space of two, maybe three. Now I have to ask, because I'm sure a lot of your fans are asking, why is that your favourite track? I don't know. I think it's a good... Um, I think it represents Cradle the Filth fairly well. It's a long song, so it covers a lot of bases. Um, bases music wise and it's a bit of a journey it starts very forlorn and majestic and very goth doomy and migrates through transitional periods of new wave of British heavy metal and black metal it's just got a bit of everything about it and of course it's got the glorious Ingrid Pitt um, yeah the, the Hungarian actress who played Countess Dracula uh, on the track as well and the song was like the culmination of the story uh, on Fortune of Beasts. So yeah, I hold a special place in my heart, for sure. 
those years when you couldn't tour because of COVID, you mentioned before that you were you were getting pretty restless during that time. But what was that like having live music taken away from you? Because I know a lot of people here in Australia really struggled with that mentally, suddenly not being able to go to two or three live shows a week. What was that like for you as a performer? Well, it was pretty shitty, naturally. We were great the first year. I, I thoroughly, I know it sounds completely selfish, but I thoroughly enjoyed the first year of lockdown. Um, because we just finished our world tour, and fortuitously as well, we just started recording a new album. So when the lockdowns happened and people couldn't travel between countries, uh, it meant that most of our band were, you know, couldn't get over. And luckily the drums have been done and we'd had extensive demos done so I could I could carry on doing what I needed to do. Um, and especially me and the producer locked away in a studio for five hours a day. Couldn't work at night really. And uh, so that was stretched out. We had fantastic weather here. It felt like being on holiday. It's a weird experience. Mm. The second year of the pandemic was obviously started to strain a bit because... Um, the album was finished and we were kind of just twiddling our thumbs. Although it wasn't quite so bad the second year here in England. I know it was quite strict in Australia, but um, we were able also to get to America. Um, we had to get some very, very special visas for that. But the tail end of the pandemic, we were touring America. So we were very lucky. The pandemic didn't hit Cradle Hill as bad as it did most people. I know bands uh, uh, had... Um, finished writing albums and were just about to go on tour, had book buses, had all their merch orders uh, fulfilled and then just couldn't do anything. And, you know, that sucked. Big to start. How is it over there now? I know a lot of people have been talking about the fact that it's difficult to get to tour Australia at the moment because of the, the cost of inflation and everything in, in this country and the... Um, the crisis that we're going through financially. What's it like there for you now with live shows? It's not so bad. It's good. Um, yeah, obviously there's a, a certain criteria that's coming into play, like some venues charging extortionate money for for merch. That seems to be the current sort of crisis at the moment. But not that we noticed it of our current, uh, our recent tour of the US co-headlining with Devil Driver. We literally just got back from that a month ago. Uh, a second leg of, is happening of that later in the year. And we're hoping to bring that to Australia, Japan and New Zealand next year. That's our busy year. This year we're, 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 is our creative year. The back end of this year, we're, we're doing a load of live stuff. But from now until September, we're basically recording a new album. We, go, we have one uh, festival in Las Vegas coming up in two weeks. As soon as we touch down on English soil, we're back into the studio, starting the drums. That's going to be like a four-month process. Uh, we do a handful of live shows by summer festivals during that period. Um, so things aren't actually too bad at the moment. Um, the, obviously, the cost of fuel, uh, buses, crew, everything's gone up with inflation. So the American tour... We, um, it was co-headline, which made obviously sharing the profit more difficult as well. But we had tricks with that. We managed to get through it. I think it's mutate and survive at the moment. I don't think it's going to get any easier anytime soon. I think the world is in a bit of recession, obviously due to the war in, in the Ukraine, one of many reasons. Um, but it's not so bad. And we do have plans to come to Australia, like I say, uh, yep. next year. We'll just have to see how things progress financially. Awesome. Now, Danny, you mentioned new music. There's some new tracks on this album as well. Uh, she is a fire, um, Demon Prince Regent. Tell us a little bit about those tracks. How did they come into being? Well, basically, they were written toward the new album. But because of the substantial delay, because of COVID, we lost two um, musicians in the band. And then we took the conscious decision like, well, we're not going to release an album with a new lineup, but two of the songs were a previous lineup. So we saw 
the live album was an opportunity bearing his mind we knew it was going to be a double album it had to be a double album so we thought no we, these songs aren't laboriously long so let's put those on the on the album one song per side they act as a kind of uh, gateway into Cradle of Filth for, for, for current fans gives an insight in what to you know what the band are doing now as well as the live material um, and then we could press reset on the writing which we did so um yeah, they were destined toward a new album, and they found a home on the live record. That's awesome. So, does it feel like a little bit of a new dawn for the band at the moment? Like you said, there's new members, there's a new record label. How does it feel right now for you? Does it feel like the, the beginning of something new? Absolutely, yeah. And we're very much looking forward to... I mean, it's a, it's a bank holiday here today, as it probably is there, May Day. And um, I... Once I finish all these interviews, I'm going to spend the day um, polishing up some lyrics and ideas for songs. Um, as we're, yeah, 90, I'd say 95%, maybe a little bit more than writing. We always, you know, leave a little bit of room for manoeuvre in the studio as well. And no doubt there'll be some changes there. Um, but we're, yeah, we're, we're pretty much there toward the new album. Now, I guess one of the questions that a lot of people are going to be asking as well is these tracks all came from that massive world tour that you did. Did you have a favourite show during that tour at all? Loads of them. We had great, yeah, we had great times on that tour. Um, and that obviously included Australia and Japan and uh, that, that side of the globe. Um, I wouldn't say favourite shows, just favourite areas favorite times um obviously world tour took in the world so there were there were i really like the the shows that are in strange places you know they, they become more events that way yeah um and if i think back to a certain day, i'd say ecuador was one of my favorites because not only was it a great show but we got to do some really cool stuff you know we went to the equator we climbed up a mountain um it was just a, it was just part of this South American leg of the tour that was just in 2019, which probably was the, the busiest year that Cradle ever had live. I mean, we did over 120 shows that year, and um, it was everywhere. And um, a big depart, well, not a big departure because it had, actually hadn't happened. But uh, chalk and cheese with the pandemic, so we had 2019 massive world tour. Uh, 2020 well closed down yeah yeah um so not not particularly favorite shows but favorite circumstances and favorite continents and the whole thing was just amazing yeah doing 120 shows in one year that is an absolutely amazing effort and a lot of musicians have told me that during covid they actually were able to let their body reset a lot of drummers in particular have said that it was a chance to let their body recover. What were you like after coming out of a year where you did 120 shows in the one year? Fine, it was good. It was just, uh, as I said, uh, selfishly, the pandemic for us was great. First yeah. year was amazing. You know, the album, very great weather here. It just felt like being on holiday. Uh, the second year was a bit of a drag, but like I say, we managed to get start playing the shows um this big live huge live streams um a substantial cost to to our well-being as well as like pocket because um we're not us but we drafted him um producer from america and he like, had <laughs> quarantine for 12 days um which obviously wasn't great and also yeah so did um so did the band you know at the time two members of who live in the Czech Republic had to quarantine for 10 days um, before doing live streams, which must have been very weird. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really notice it myself. I mean, I, I, you know, I can recover in a week. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we were, it was fortuitous, the fact that we, like I said, finished a world tour and had written an album. Yeah. Being a fan of yours for so many years, I noticed when I was listening to this album that I kept on finding myself being transported back to 
times in my life when these tracks were around. Like one of them, I was thinking this track was played at our wedding, and there was another track where I was thinking I remember I was mourning the loss of a good friend when I first heard this song. Was that something that you know that fans will go through while they listen to this album, that it'll actually transport them back to when they first heard some of these tracks and, and maybe milestones in their lives as well? Uh, maybe. I mean, it does span uh, quite a, you know, a lucrative, lengthy career. And that's what we wanted to do with the record. When we, we had that wish list of songs we already put on it, obviously, that we had to have played them. But we didn't want to concentrate solely on new material or newer albums. And we didn't want to concentrate solely just on, you know, the back catalogue. Um, we early back catalogue. We were a very, you know, smorgasbord of hits. So, yeah. And we also, yeah, there were other prerogatives, like I said, fan favourites, um, legendary songs, you know, that maybe not, we would play live like Baffrey Ariel all the time. Uh, so, yeah, it's quite an eclectic mix. You get stuff like Zara and Violent o- Overture, uh, Lost More Than Wargasm, them, uh, rubbing shoulders with like the death of love from Godspeed and Devil's Thunder and Blackest Magic in Practice from Hammer of the Witches, Born in a Burial Gown from Bitter Sweets. You know, it's, it is an eclectic mix, and again, way to appeal to our fans rather than to our collective personal tastes. Definitely. And talking of those fans, there's some absolutely great um, versions of this that are coming out with the deluxe box set and things like that. How much of a say did the band have over those uh, different box sets and different formats on vinyl and things like that? Well, obviously, it's a prerogative of the record company to earn money. With the onset of the digital age, obviously, the record industry, and especially the metal industry, has been hit really hard, or at least... The bands have, and obviously they're the lifeblood of the scene. Without the bands, there's no no music. Without the music, there's no record companies. And uh, bands have to earn money, believe it or not. You know, it's our job. At the end of the day, we don't like calling it a job, but it's a job. And uh, you have to have one eye on the creative side and one eye also on the business side. It's just part and parcel of life. We don't live at home with our parents anymore, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, you know, you've got to look out for yourselves and record companies are going to want to do that sort of thing. What we do is make sure that we're very happy with everything and it's top quality. We're not asking our fans to buy them, but if they want to, the opportunity's there. Um, but yeah, we do put a lot of effort into it and we do have the final say. Um, it's always been a prerogative of Cradle of Filth to release good stuff um, and not a piece of cheap shit, you know, just for the sake of it. Exactly. <laughs> well, Danny, I know we are running out of time very quickly, so I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today on Subculture, but also, is there anything you'd like to say to your fans out there before they sit down and listen to this amazing live album? Well, I just want to thank you all for your continued support. We're hoping, like I say, to get across to uh, Australasia. Um uh, next year, I mean, the plans are afoot. Uh, I just can't, you know, it's now a year before, so I can't yeah. actually say when and where, but I know it's happening um, because I'm in conversation with our booking agent, and so is Des, our manager. Um, yes, uh, so the live album is out now, came out on Friday. Um, other than that, we've got our collaboration with Ed Sheeran which is just one song that should be coming out uh, hopefully uh, August, September uh, as a charity single and our new album well I can only guess it will be coming out roughly around this time next year next year is a busy year for us so hopefully we'll see our fans um, on the live front and yes thank you ever so much for your continued support because without you guys, then there is no cradle of film. We'd just be, you know, redundant in our bedrooms. Sitting in our underpants, probably wanking. <laughs>
And sadly, we have to draw to a close this episode of Subculture After Dark. Mate, what have you got lined up over the next couple of weeks? Because we've got some exciting stuff happening, haven't we? We we do have all sorts of odds and ends and... going through our, <laughs> our different shows. But um, yeah, we've we've had a response to uh, our our call out for you know some heavy rock covers of other songs, and so tell them what we've been sent, Dave. Yeah, so there's a dark wave band called Host, and um, they have just released a, a cover which they've sent to us by um, an old track by the Flock of Seagulls called Iran. Um, now they've decided to cover that and send it to us. And this is exactly what they say. I'm actually going to be reading this right now. So Greg McIntosh said, it was not my idea to do this song as a cover. I wasn't totally convinced at first. The original, while being a great song, seemed a little bit frothy and a little bit light to me. But when I isolated the vocal line, however, I saw a tragedy in it and I wanted to take it down to a darker, more dystopian path. So we're going to play that on um, the next edition of the of subculture after dark and we're hoping that we might be able to get host um on the phone to chat about it we've uh, we've reached out to them and said hey guys you've sent us the song any interest in in being on the show so we'll see how that goes um yeah it's a really good track like they've passed it through to me as soon as he received it and it's fantastic yeah so good work guys definitely so yeah we'll see how that goes as well um we do have some pretty big names that are going to be on the next show as well again we're not going to talk about who they are because you never know like we had with the burning witches um debacle at the start of the show tonight. <laughs> you, you, you don't really know what's going to happen but um i do have but a hey couple... we got a creative filth so you know exactly but uh yeah <laughs> in the world of interviews you never know what's going to happen but uh Something we can deliver on is I promised you at the start of the show that we had a brand new Australian track that you're all going to want to hear. Well, a lot of you um, will know the band The Last Martyr, fronted um, by Monica, who a lot of us have worked with over the years. I worked with her at, at Heavy Mag. Now, they are getting they are gearing up for Unify this year, but they've got a brand new single out too called Comedy Tragedy, which we are about to play in just a moment. And... Of course, our classic track this time around, we thought Mr. Filth did come on the show, so let's play a Cradle of Filth song. Um, you may have heard in the interview I mentioned that a Cradle of Filth song got played at my wedding. Well, we're going to play that track that was played at our wedding at the end of the show today, um, Nephenamine. Mix. So this is our romantic memory episode now. <laughs> Definitely. So, look, But that was something that he talked about during the interview. Um, Danny was talking about how one of the reasons that they wanted to do this live album was that it it's it's a little bit different from a greatest hits, but it brings back memories for people. So, um, and definitely when I was listening to the album, I had that memory of, Hey, yeah, we played that song at our wedding. So uh, yeah, I thought we would actually close the show today with um, an amphetamine fix, but we wanted to play this new track from the last martyr first. So you're going to have a little bit of a double right now to finish off the show. But uh, if people want more information from all things subculture, Harley, what can they do? Well, they just need to pop right along to our website, www.subcultureentertainment.com, or they can reach us on social media. Look for Subculture Entertainment on Facebook, Discord, Twitter, or look for Subculture Dave on Instagram. Yeah, And if- any of these you know, channels, you can send through your covers of classic songs you know something we're not expecting because we've had a really good return so far so keep it up guys definitely and if you want all your heavy music and alternative music news um our website is a great one for that because as soon as we get the information and the news coming through from publicists it goes up on our site so um straight up so there's heaps to look at on there definitely but uh to finish off the show first of all we're going to play the last martyrs brand new track comedy tragedy and then we're going to finish it off with a classic from cradle of filth but uh thank you so much for listening we'll be back in two weeks time but for now i've been dave g and i've been harley catch you on the flip side
No, we 